Hello, everyone, and welcome to Blogging Theology. Today, I'm delighted to talk again to Imam Tom. Welcome back, sir. Thank you so much. Wa alaikum salam wa ta'ala. It's great to be back. Nice to see you. Um, Imam uh, Tom Fokini converted to Islam in 2010, a year before he finished his BA in political science uh, from Vasa College. He studied at the Islamic University in Medina from 2015 to 2020, where he obtained his BA from the Faculty of Sharia. Imam Tom is currently the research director of Islam and Society at the Akin Institute for Islamic Research. He's also the resident scholar uh, of Utica Masjid in Utica, New York, in America, obviously. He also teaches tafsir and Islamic history online through Legacy International Online High School. And he lives in Utica, New York, with his wife and three children. And as you know, Tom has kindly uh, agreed to discuss the books that have made a significant difference to him intellectually. And today, um, Tom will continue and indeed conclude uh, his discussion on uh, of an extremely important book, uh, The Impossible State. There's an amazing cover, uh, Islam, Politics and Modernity's Moral Predicament by Wa'al Halak. And uh, indeed, and um, this is part five and the final uh, in this particular series. And we may, we may well go on to do other works in the future, inshallah. And for those who don't know, Halak is professor in the humanities at Columbia University in the States, where he's been teaching ethics, uh, law, and political thought since 2009. He is considered a leading scholar in the field of Islamic legal studies and has been described as one of the world's leading authorities on Islamic law. So uh, over to you, Imam Tom. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, salat um, So uh, thank you. Be to Allah, first of all, for the privilege to come back and have this conversation, uh, Paul. It's really always a pleasure. We've taken a bit of a, of a hiatus, um, and so a lot of people were wondering, are we going to complete it? How are we going to, when are we going to complete it? So, alhamdulillah, inshallah, this will take us through the end of the book. And the reason for that is that you know, a lot of things are happening, especially in the Western world that's affecting the Muslim community right now. And um, uh, things need to be responded to and people need to be informed. And uh, I consider Halak's works, especially The Impossible State and his work, his uh, subsequent work, Restating Orientalism, to be essential reading for Muslims. And so in the interest of time, I think we might, um, we'll, we'll finish this book today. Um, I've read a couple academic critiques of this book um, that I think as a in a future video i'd like to respond to and mm. almost as a, as a segue to the follow-up work which is restating orientalism um mm. but we'll we'll cross that bridge when we get there yeah. as for today um we start with chapter five which is the political subject and moral technologies of the self now um we're shifting here because previously um halak had been talking about sort of the the big picture he was talking about the state talking about sovereignty talking about um, the Islamic society, you know, um, things are very theoretical. We're going to shift our focus now to another very key difference between uh, sort of modern society and Islamic society. And again, um, Halak's thesis that these two things are incompatible. And again, we're not saying modernity in the sense of um, something com contemporaneous, right? That's a very, very lay um, uh, popular definition of what modernity is. Modernity is not simply having technology. It's not simply being in 2023 or whatever the calendar date says. Modernity is a package of values. It's a constellation of metaphysical beliefs that has resulted in unhinged technology, uh, immoral uh, uh, environmental sort of degradation and destruction, et cetera, et cetera, as he details earlier on in the, in the book. So the question, again, that he's seeking to ask with uh, the, and with answers with the provocative title, um, the impossible state, is that this thing that we call modernity, this uh, conglomeration or this amalgamation of values and metaphysical uh, beliefs, is Islam compatible with it? And the emphatic answer is no. Um, and so the different stages of this book and the different chapters of this book are laying out different ways in which uh, it isn't compatible and demonstrating why these two things are, these two completely different paradigms are at loggerheads are completely incompatible. And so this time in chapter five, we're looking at subject formation. OK, we're looking at what is the type of subject that the modern nation state produces and seeks to produce? And what is the type of subject? What is the type of subjectivity that 
the Islamic society or the Sharia based society, even if it's an idealized version that seeks to produce. Um, and after doing that, he demonstrates that those two are very, very incompatible. Um, mm -hmm. the, just to give a bird's eye view, the following chapter, then he talks about one of the most common questions that people have after you dare to dream about the Khilafah or about uh, an Islamic sort of governance. How would Islamic governance fit in with modern society uh, at a global scale, with, with um, sort of the globalization with other nation states that aren't so constituted? How would it fit in? And then finally, he has his concluding chapter, chapter number seven, the central domain of the moral. So inshallah, we will co cover all of that. Recall that, you know, Halak operates within the tradition of Foucault in some important ways, in I think the most fruitful and useful ways. And this is something that people um, should appreciate about Halak, is that Halak takes the best, in my opinion, uh, critiques, the most useful critiques of, say, Foucault, of Schmidt, of other thinkers. Um, and he utilizes them in really, really important ways that are very relevant to uh, Islam and the project of an Islamic society. So one of these things that he takes from uh, Foucault's analysis is the difference between pre-modern and modern power. Okay, Foucault says that pre-modern power is what he called sovereign power. So you can imagine um, uh, sort of a monarch, you know, violently executing somebody and sticking their head on a spear and, and putting it out for everyone to see. That sort of is that very sort of external um, spectacle of power. That's what Foucault referred to as sovereign power. Whereas the modern period is defined by a different type of power altogether, what Foucault called a disciplinary power. So basically the attempt here is not to just work on the external aspect of the human being, but to excavate them from the inside, to shape them and build them up, uh, sometimes displace what they had previously from the inside so that they become a willing subject so that they become a willing, obedient, and docile sort of um, adherent of the entire package of values that you're attempting to, uh, to put forth. So when we look at this, Halak wants us to understand that the modern nation state, it engages with the second type of power, what Foucault would call disciplinary power. And it's quite nefarious, and it produces a specific type of subject. Is it really unique? Halak dares to, to ask and answer this question in the beginning of this chapter. Is this type of, um, you know, because there's a school of thought out there or some thinkers, they try to universalize and transhistoricize every phenomenon by saying, well, it's always been this way. You know, there's nothing really special about European colonialism. The Chinese were cl colonizing people and, you know, African nations were colonizing people. There's nothing particular about a uh, modern state uh, craft that really there's always been states and governments have always spied on their citizens and always killed people. Halak says no way, that's not true, that there is a fundamental difference between pre-modern and modern societies. Actually, there's several differences. And one of these differences, he says, is that pre-modern societies had something of what he calls an organic constitution. Okay, And that means that they were to a certain degree outside of the valence or the, the area of influence of the governing structure. The governing structure had a limited amount of penetration, especially into the rural areas and the hinterlands, etc. But even in the urban centers, the, the, the governments were not nearly as effective or as interested in controlling your inner thoughts, policing your inner thoughts, your inner opinions, your inner beliefs. Uh, that is something that is particularly modern. The other thing that Halak points out is that pre-modern societies can be characterized by a certain degree, again, degree of self-rule. Again, when you have the hinterlands, or you take civilizations, you look at these maps, okay, and uh, the Roman Empire is purple, and uh, the Carthaginian Empire is, or Carolingian Empire is, is green, or whatever it is, and the map communicates to you a certain, eh, it's a certain belief, that's or a certain lie, let's just call it what it is, a certain lie, that these borders were very, very um, impenetrable, okay, and that they were very stable. In reality, at that time in the pre-modern world, these borders and barriers were very, very permeable. And the governing sort of, or the degree of governance did not reach or extend to the, the, the final line of purple on the map that is supposedly within your territory or the territory that you claim. In mm -hmm. fact, 
the reality on the ground is that the people were mostly ruling themselves and that they had to pay some sort of tribute or they had to do some sort of thing once in a while to you know demonstrate their fealty or their um you know uh their subordination to some larger power or civil or um, empire but that the reality on the ground in the pre-modern era was mostly defined by self-rule when we get to the modern era, we find that things are completely flipped. We find that by definition, the modern state is interested in uh, totalizing their control over that territory. If the map says purple, the United States of America, then you best believe that every single square inch of that territory is going to be at least ideally, maybe not, they haven't achieved their goals yet, but they are striving to achieve full and total domination over every single square inch of that territory and not just the territory of the land but also the interior territory of the subjects in which they can sort of attempt to construct a certain subjectivity that is willing to be governed and dominated in such a way so the modern era halak says and he's following foucault here reflects a unique system or unique systems of order and discipline and has produced unprecedented subjectivities that is Halak's claim, okay? So in the rest of the chapter, he's going to do three things. The first thing he's going to look, what is the subjectivity that the modern nation state produces? What is the subjectivity that an Islamic society or a Sharia-based society produces? And are they compatible or not? You already know his answer is no, but he's going to give you the specifics as to why he believes it is not. So we look into the production of nation state subjects. Who is the subject that the modern nation state wishes to produce? In one word, the modern nation state wishes to produce the citizen. Okay, the citizen is a concept that did not exist until the rise of the nation state, or at least it didn't take on the meanings that it now connotes. Yes, if you go back to the ancient Greeks, they had, you know, technically this term citizenship, etc. But it's not the same type of thing that is the content is different from what modern nation states mean when they say that they are trying to produce citizens. Halak goes into a little bit of history and he offers a potential motive for why the nation state wanted to produce this type of citizen. He talks about urbanization. He talks about the population booms in the urban centers and the rise of the urban poor. He also talks about the massive influx of colonial loot that the Western European world, uh, you know, brutally uh, extracted from the Americas and from Africa and from other places, right? And he said that there arose a need in order to control these um, unruly um, and potentially rebellious urban population and urban dispossessed, sometimes landless and generally unruly uh, populations. So how do they do it? Um, they did it with the invention of novel institutions or the conversion of previous institutions into new forms that achieved this inner disciplinary power. So this is again following Foucault. Foucault talks a lot about these sorts of things, police, prisons, school, and public health slash hospitals. These are the main locations and they actually all work together in order to produce a certain subjectivity and actually to, um, to govern, right? They are, they, are, they are tentacles of the state. They are under state control. That doesn't mean that they're identical with the state. It's not that the president is operating the hospitals, but the state plays referee, the state issues directives and the state sets the bounds that shape the area in which these institutions can function. So with police, obviously police dramatically increase the, um, the, the um, sort of the, what's the word I'm looking for? The advent, the advent of surveillance, right? And it's true that surveillance was something that has existed since time immemorial, but not to this degree, not the idea of the closed circuit television cameras and we have spying and espionage, uh, espionage. we have NSA wiretapping your phones and every, Google selling your data and everybody sort of with everything on record about you. This is something that is a diagnostic of modern disciplinary power that did not exist before. Um, prisons, this sort of, you know, which sort of crimes uh, are deemed sort of worthy. Um, you know, obviously there's a huge asymmetry in the modern world between sort of the petty crimes that get someone arrested and then sort of the white collar crimes, as we call them, hiding your money in a in a sort of a tax shell country like with these Caribbean islands. Everybody gets off scot-free insider trading, which, you know, the government folks 
often do and rarely get caught. You know, um, things that maybe are even, let's even say committing war crimes, such as Tony Blair and George Bush and, and many others, Obama, et cetera. These are things that get off scot-free. Who are the people filling the prisons? The people filling the prisons are people who are guilty of much, much less uh, crime than that, petty crimes. And this is a way of disciplining the populace and producing a certain subjectivity. More important than these, def in my estimation, I think also Halax is the school. State education is one of the hallmarks of modern governmentality, of the modern disciplinary power. And mm -hmm. we don't need to look very far when we see the debates and the sort of issues, the hot button issues that are arising today that demonstrate that the school is a tentacle of the state. Look at how, first of all, in much of the first world, quote unquote, or the, the Western world, schooling or state education is mandatory. Okay. Mm -hmm. In the United States, we have a little bit of an exception. We have a tradition of homeschooling, that kind of that rugged pioneer sort of uh, yeah, tradition, um, self-reliance, et cetera, et cetera. But in many of the European countries, you do not have the luxury to homeschool. In fact, in places like Sweden and Norway, if you attempt to homeschool, it is a crime. And that in is just- France and in France now as well. They stopped that in France. Yes, exactly. So this is actually um, a crime. You can have your children taken away from you if you attempt to uh, to educate your own children. Okay, so what does this communicate to you about the type of power and the type of subject that the state is trying to uh, is trying to produce? It demonstrates that they are um, the. Oh, we'll get to this later. I'll, we'll put it on the shelf there. Yeah, go can ahead. I just mention an example? I was just looking at the uh, the news recently in the last week. Um, Maryland court, this is a, is a state in the United States, Maryland court says parents can't opt kids out of LGBTQ plus curriculum, not a fundamental right, argues uh, the federal court in Maryland. So uh, parents can't opt their kids out of uh, reading books which uh, violate uh, the family's religious beliefs uh, that the family sees as a form of indoctrination. So here we have uh, the state uh, directly uh, infusing certain values or views uh, into uh, the children of these parents. And the parents are powerless to have any say over it. Um, and this is an example, of course, of Zachary is saying, or Halak is saying, of the, the intrusiveness of the modern state to control all aspects of the education of children. And that wasn't the case, as you might be going, I don't know, to say, uh, with, with education in, in other contexts in the past. Yes, 100%. That's a textbook example. Um, mm -hmm. Everything that's going on right now, the the logic, the implicit logic of it is that the state has more right to your children than you do. The state has more right to produce a certain subject within the body of your child than you do. Um, and this is a totalitarian logic that did not exist before. And this is something that is, again, diagnostic of the nation state. Um, the last one is, is the hospital, public health, what sort of is determined as a mental illness. Um, you know, a very, very hot topic, not to say that there is not genuine mental illness, but let's say the over prescription or the over, excuse me, um, you know, the over diagnosis of ADD and ADHD, right? The punishment or criminalization of certain behaviors that don't fit into the cookie cutter model of what the state sort of expects out of its citizens. Um, this is all, you know, the the sort of cordoning off or the quarantining off of any sort of mental illness or personality disorders, schizophrenia, et cetera. Even in Saudi Arabia today, this is something that I found when I lived there between 2015 and 2020. These people were integrated in the communities. These people were at the weddings and at the prayers and at, you know, you would know that somebody had mental illness or had a schizophrenia or had, you know, multiple personality disorder. With the modern West, we put them in hospitals, we put them in insane asylums, as Foucault has documented very well, um, that we treat it as a pathology and we quarantine them. We take them out of society and put them, shut them away. Um, this is all part of the state's ideal subject. Who is the ideal subject that the state is producing and managing that in the population? If we're to illustrate sort of or, or drill down on what are the two qualities that the state are looking for in their subjects, all this, you know, these institutions that they have, the tentacles that they have to produce the subject, what are they looking for? They're looking for two things, Halak says. The first is submission. Okay, the first is submission to its ruling order and its its uh, its machinations. And the second is utility. And by utility, we're talking about productivity. There's a famous comment that you know, former President Barack Obama said to the king of Saudi Arabia. He said, you'll never get ahead with half of your workforce still staying at home. And he was referring to the women. Oh, this oh. is. Yeah, this is this is 
attack. I've not heard that before, actually. That's oh. a very revealing comment by Obama. It's, <laughs> it's an extremely revealing comment, and it is a perfect sort of uh, uh, soundbite that represents the logic of the liberal nation state. We'll get into the liberal part later, but the liberal nation state only looks at its subjects or the idealized subject is the productive subject. If you look at, oh, I really wish I could I could find it. I was looking at the terminology, doing a little bit of research on the terminology that states use to describe somebody who uh, doesn't work a waged job. You know, for example, my wife uh, is a homemaker, okay? Like she tends to the children, et cetera, et cetera. She does work, okay? In the modern capitalistic parlance, it's not read or legible as work. It's considered, quote unquote, just staying at home, which is, you know, a slap in the face to all women who actually do work very, very hard to make a proper home and educate their children, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I wish I could recall, there was one European nation that termed it um, something rather degrading. It was a rather derogatory remark to anybody who's outside of the waged workforce, something like idols or something like this to indicate that basically their uselessness. Um, and this is, again, an indication the terminology matters of the logic of the state and the subject that the state is trying to produce. The state wants you to be a productive citizen. That's why, you know, people get caught up in the individualistic personal choice when they talk about should women have a career or not have a career? Well, I find I find myself fulfilled to have a career and I want to do this and I want to contribute. That's all well and good. But it elides the fact that is the nation state partial or impartial to your decision to have a career or not if you are a woman. Uh, the nation state is not impartial. They are emphatically partial to uh, making sure that you have a career, that they can tax your income, that they can make you put their children in public schools to indoctrinate them into their submissive and uh, productive citizen subject that they're attempting to go for. And so when you find yourself as an adult woman Ask yourself where your sense of value comes from. Does your sense of value come from being in the home and taking care of your husband and taking care of your children? Or do you feel like you're not enough? Do you feel like you're you know, in, inadequate? Um, do you feel guilty if you got an education, but now you're not doing anything with it? What is that anything that people say when they're saying doing anything with it? What it means is that the state has colonized your mind and that they have sort of taught you that the only things that are legible as doing anything are wage labor that is taxable. That is exactly what the state is pushing. That's why they try to put your sense of self in those decisions from a very, very young age. And that's why the choice you, you make might not be a very free choice at all. So we ask here, okay, so what's the difference? Okay, <clears throat> what's the big deal? Somebody again could come in with this sort of, you know, um, tired argument that this is nothing new. This is something we've seen before. Halak will say, no, this is very new. This is very different. Why? Because these um, institutions and this whole thrust of subject formation, it is not coming from the subject itself. Okay. It is imposed from outside, but it's also not coming from a local organic community which was also the case in pre-modern societies. And we'll get there with Islamic examples, such as the halakha, such as your relationship with your local imam and the local meshid and the local elders and your tribe and whatever sort of thing you, the guilds, like even we can go to European history. We had this before the onset of modernity where the subjectivities were outside the scope of the nation state if the nation state even existed at that time. And the subject formation was taken care of by locally organic institutions, the family, the tribe, and the faith. So we have here another aspect of modern power is that notice how all of these institutions are diffuse, okay? The authority and the subject formation is diffused. It's not concentrated in one figurehead, in one king or one monarch or one emperor, right? Before, if you had a sort of, again, a, a one type of pre-modern governance, it was all focused within the location of this one person. So even if you were opposed to it, you could at least point the finger and say, hey, that's the guy that I want to correct or take out or replace or displace or change. When it comes to modern power, the difference between sovereign power and disciplinary power, there's no one to hold accountable. You have these institutions that are run by bureaucratic rules, administrative policies and procedures. It's a headless monster. You can't tell where to push back. You can't tell which button to, pu to push or to who to hold accountable. 
And it's not necessarily an argument that this is not part of state subject formation to say that, well, these things aren't really fully controlled by the state. There's hospital systems, for example, that um, they're not state owned. They're private. There are schools that are private. There are sort of other, you know, um, police forces, not really, maybe militias and things like that that are private. What if someone argues that these things are actually outside of the dictates of the government? We would say that the nation state it plays referee. If it doesn't act directly, it acts indirectly by approving who is allowed to act and who is not allowed to act. It grants legitimacy to certain schools and it takes legitimacy away from other schools. It grants legitimacy to doctors and, and boards that approve doctors and th boards that ap approve hospitals, and it takes legitimacy away from them. So in fact, they are all tentacles of the state and the state gets to set the rules of the game. One of the things, okay, so within this calculus, we have the, the modern world, the modern state, it has its subject that it wants to produce. Halak mentioned something very, very interesting that gets back to our example about sort of, um, you know, quote unquote, women's rights, career versus staying home, etc. He talks about the issue of problems, okay, and he says that um, when it comes to modern statecraft and modern disciplinary power, it sees problems or creates problems in places where they don't necessarily exist. Because this is another counter argument or counter critique to everything that Halak is saying. Some people would say, well, what do you want? Without modern nation states, we wouldn't have the paved roads, we wouldn't have literacy, we wouldn't have etc. All the good things that the government does for us, we wouldn't be able to have it if if it didn't have this sort of totalitarian aspect of centralized education, you know, they'll say before centralized education, people weren't able to read and people had, you know, died of, of uh, you know, uh, curable diseases. And they'll play these sort of typical modernist scare tactics. Well, Halak says that conceiving of these things as problems is not a given. OK, first of all, it's not self-evident that everything here is a problem. You know, yes, literacy is a good thing. Even Islam encourages literacy, but it doesn't render someone immoral uh, to be illiterate, first of all. Just as to have a curable disease that goes uncured um, is not necessarily the worst thing in the world. It might actually be your path to paradise, right? So there's a different relationship to these sorts of things. The state finds them and reads them as problems and then assumes it has the ability to solve them. There are other possible solutions to these things if we're to grant their status as problems, illiteracy and dying of communicable diseases, et cetera, et cetera. It doesn't necessarily follow that the nation state has to be the one to solve them. In fact, it might be that the nation state is incapable of actually solving them in a final way. And we're going to circle around to that in the very, very last page of the book. If we look at one sort of, you know, one sort of case study or example where we can see all these things on display, it is the family. If we look at how the family is a particular concern, and it also brings us back to your example with Montgom Montgomery County, Maryland, how the family is one of the most primary locations of legislation for the modern nation state, because the modern nation state had had to reconfigure what the family was and what it meant in order to achieve this sort of power to uh, to produce the subjects that it would like to produce the citizen who is submissive and is productive. The family used to be understood as a sacred collective, okay, a, co a, a sacred collective that was more concerned with building a moral uh, a moral individual. We'll get to that more when we talk about Islamic subjectivity, right, and giving children, working together, charity, altruism, you know, codependence, these sorts of things, the modern nation state came along and turned it into a unit of production. And with suffrage, with women's suffrage, it's very, very interesting, by the way, if you look into the female anti-suffragettes, okay, there were women who were against um, the quote-unquote right to vote, um, you know, in the UK and the US. And one of their principal arguments, one of their principal arguments was that it would take that society up until that point was made up of families and that even the nation state counted them and allotted things to them and granted them access on the basis of being a family. And that with the rights, uh, quote unquote, the right to vote extended to women, that it would change from viewing the 
fundamental unit of society from a family to that of the individual instead. And that is, in fact, exactly what happened. Not to say that women shouldn't be allowed to vote. That's a separate topic. But this was one of the consequences and one of the negative consequences that it wrought on Western society. So the state gets to play the arbiter of what is in the true interests of the child. And this is where we make full circle to, quote unquote, LGBTQ, quote unquote, rights, um, where they're being force fed and imposed upon our children. And the state, as in Montgomery County, Maryland, gets to come in and say, this is actually in the, ch the child's best interest, not you and your parochial religion and these sort of fairy tales that you believe in. You can keep that at home. Or as one of the um, city council members, I believe, from uh, uh, from this particular area said, you can teach around facts at home, but when you come to but when you come to school, the the state rules, the, and the state gets to be the final arbiter of what is truly in the interest of the child. Halak says that this is the conversion of the patriarchy of the family to the patriarchy of the state. The state becomes the father of all children, and the state gets to decide what they're taught, what's appropriate to teach them what is fact and what is not, um, and even gets to take them away under certain circumstances. Uh, so just another quick footnote. Uh, you might have heard in the, in the news just a couple of days ago, the, the French Secretary of State uh, decreed uh, um, that uh, a certain form of uh, dress should not be worn by uh, women, uh, of young women in schools. But it was the language he used. He used the word emancipation at one point. He said, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, uh, schools are a space, a secular space, uh, to emancipate uh, uh, f females. In other words, a, d a direct criticism there of Islam, uh, that the state there is to free women from the their obligations to dress modestly and in accordance with their faith. Um, this is more than paternalism, that this is uh, social engineering, changing the religion to suit certain secular militant values. Uh, it's very explicit, very in your face, and very targeted specifically at Muslims. Um, but that's a different subject. But we see it in the States of Maryland and in France at the moment, these these moves being made. Yes, it's extremely revealing. It's extremely revealing. And so in, in this um, scenario, every teacher, every guidance counselor, every psychiatrist becomes a tentacle of the state. OK, very, very seldom. OK, does somebody sort of push against the grain and try to create a space um, where they're able to allow something that is otherwise sort of di against the dictates of the state? We've seen from the recordings that came out of Canada, you had teachers doing the work of the state, shaming Muslim students when they came back to class after skipping uh, Pride Day or, you know, something you know for celebrating LGBTQ. Right. Mm -hmm. The teachers being the, the tentacle of the state in that moment saying what you did was disgusting, I can't believe it, you know, it's filled with hatred, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So they're all sort of working in tandem, whether they know it or not. This is not to talk about their intentions. This is just talking about facts on the ground. The other aspect, so we have the state, okay? So we talked that the state has to produce. What's its aim in producing a subjectivity? What type of subjectivity and subject is it trying to produce? Trying to produce a citizen, okay? And a citizen is defined by docility, right, submission, and by utility, produ productivity. There's also one piece missing that the citizen absolutely has to have, according to the state, in order for this whole thing to work, and that is nationalism, okay? The discourse of nationalism has to be present and it has to displace whatever, whatever other sort yeah. of group identity is in place in that person's subjectivity in order for the whole thing to work. Mm -hmm. uh, Nationalism is the primary meaning and identity that is sought to be imparted to the individual. Um, it is a political, not a metaphysical integration. So this is another nice contrast point, whereas imagine in a pre-modern time or in a more Islamic society, what's the sort of group identity, okay, that somebody is being sort of integrated into, okay, that their subjecthood yeah. is being integrated into. Uh, a community of souls, right? A purposeful sort of creation in which you have duty and responsibility and uh, moral accountability and things like that. This is the right way, and we'll get to that in a second. The nation state replaces this with the integration into a political uh, body, a political body that you are expected to make the ultimate sacrifice for uh, yeah. when called upon, first of all, yeah. and that you are expected to um, basically dissolve yourself in um, at every sort of uh, passing and crossing.
Yeah, if I could just briefly quote from uh, Walhalak like on that on page 106 in uh, The Impossible State, he says, nationalism is perhaps the most significant source and groundwork of meaning available to its subjects. The subjects meaning, you know, people, us. If we live in a world of states, and if out-of-state existence is impossible, which it is in the modern world, we can't live outside of states, there's simply no physical space left, then we must all live as national citizens. We have no choice. We are the nation and the nation is us. This is as fundamental as it is and is inescapable realities. We have no choice. Nationalism engulfs both the individual and the collective. It produces the I and we dialectically and separately. Not only does nationalism produce the community and its individual members, it is itself, it is itself the community and its realized individual subjects. For without these, there is no nationalism, end quote. I get the sense there of the, the totality, the totalitarianism of nationalism. It engulfs the individual uh, in the we, in the collective. It's a cosmic, he calls it a cosmic metaphysics as well. Yes, and there's a couple consequences of this. So first of all, you know, this, this is why we pair when we talk about this sort of um, technology of government, which is the state, the modern state, we often pair it with the word nation, nation state, you know, because of what Halak just said, there is no separating the two, there is no state without the nation, and there is no nation without the state. If the citizen is the individual identity and memory that is the individual subject that the state produces. The nation is the collective identity and the collective um, sort of interior psychology that the state is attempting to produce. So yeah. there's a, a, a trinity, a holy trinity here. Okay, <laughs> there's the state and citizen and nation, and all of them have to be in place in order for the power to be uh, effective and controlling. And the other sort of consequence is that the personality that this produces, okay, mm -hmm. It is completely um, displacing, okay? It cannot simultaneously exist with an Islamic personality or with any other type of personality even, okay? Because there are certain values that are being communicated in primarily identifying yourself as a citizen and as part of a nation, which is a political category. It is, and it assumes a certain materialistic definition of selfhood and action. It assumes um, an instrumental quality to, to, to rationality and to reason. It assumes um, a certain narcissism, right? That this is really just all about your individual fervor. It's very atomizing. Um, it might sound like a big collective, right? The nation, yes, but at the end of the day, it's made up of individuals as opposed to say like a multi sort of textured and layered sort of society that has multiple different sort of uh, corporate enterprises or ways. Yeah, to say, so we become, we become nationalized narcissists, narcissists. Exactly. Yes. We become nationalized narcissists on page 120. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And, and also with an eye to efficiency, recall that the citizen is, um, fully a citizen when they are uh, they are productive, right? And so there is a, a big sort of, you know, why do people, let's say, if we're to, to imagine society, what is the perfect age or the favored age of people in our society? Okay, it would definitely be the working age <laughs> between somewhere between 20 and 60. Okay, once you're uh, retired, once you're whatever, yeah, you may get some benefits, you might get like, uh, you know, uh, your paycheck every month, but you're largely forgotten uh, in in modern nation state sort of culture um, because your utility and your productivity to the state has taken a huge hit. Everything, this totalizing logic has many consequences. We'll just go through maybe um, one mm. more is that mm. one of them is that if this is your way of identifying and this is your way of seeing the world, it actually insulates you from being affected spiritually by spiritual technologies of the self, okay? To have that nationalized narcissism, to have this materialistic understanding of both the self, what is real, right? And also of action, to instrumentalize your reason to, you know, whatever it takes for the nation to pay any sacrifice, et cetera. You're almost immune to subject formation attempts by a spiritual regime, which is why. Christians in the United States have a huge problem with this because they have essentially turned their dean into politics. And you see that that's what makes them actually able to um, look the other way when it comes to 
a politician, let's say, that is extremely <laughs> immoral, um, that breaks oh, that. He, I have no idea who you mean, Tom. You're being very obscure. Yeah, here. you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very cryptic <laughs> like that, you know. Um, or even even like the movement as a whole, how could they even tolerate someone who womanizes, somebody who drinks, somebody who is crude and rude and, and et cetera? Yeah. Right? The only reason that they're able to tolerate this and and sort of maintain this cognitive dissonance is because in reality, their subjectivity is more that of the nation and citizen than it is of a Christian soul tied to some sort of collective body such like Christendom that used to exist in the Middle Ages, for example. They mm -hmm. have been thoroughly secularized and they have been thoroughly sort of subsumed by the uh, idea of the nation state. And so we see, and this is just like a, a, a very, very small detail. We see also um, the the sort of conversion of work. Okay, so I like think about how the the meaning of the term vocation has changed historically. Vocation literally comes from being called to do something. It's almost like an yeah. inner uh, inspiration. Like I feel a vocation to go make dawa or to go study the dean or etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. In the United States, and I'm not sure if British English also follows this this trend, but a vocational education now is seen as a practical education. Okay, it's seen as one that you're going to be an electrician, or you're going to be a plumber, or you're going to be something that is a trade, is a hard skill, right? This is mirroring sort of the nationalistic and the statist sort of conversion of um, a different type of regime of self. Okay, converting it into something that is productive, wageable, taxable, and legible within the calculus of the nation state. So that leaves us off with the type, uh, a decent sense, I think, of the subject that the, the, the modern nation state is attempting to produce with its mm -hmm. holy trinity of state, citizen, and uh, nation. What about Islamic subjectivity? Uh, how does it depart? How does it differ? Uh, Halak has a really nice portion where he talks about, and I think I'll quote from here too, where he talks about the importance of historical experience and how all of the sort of technology and the aim and the teleology of the of the um, of the modern nation state, we can't forget, as he said at the beginning of the book, it comes out of European historical experience, and therefore it is aimed to solve the problems that were born of that particular historical experience, historical experience that Muslims largely didn't have. And so when we think about these things, it actually has tremendous ramifications for where we put our sort of projects, what, what sort of things we think need to be done about the self, about subjecthood, and about society. Um, so for example, he says on page uh, 110, oh, yeah. the, the political, yes, the political absolutism that Europe experienced, the merciless serfdom of feudalism, the abuses of the church, the inhumane realities of the industrial revolution, and all that which made revolutions necessary in Europe were not the lot of Muslims. On the whole, and despite the inescapable cruelties of human life and its miseries, which obviously are not the preserve of pre-moderns only, Muslims, comparatively speaking, lived for over a millennium in a far more egalitarian and merciful system, and, most importantly for us, under a rule of law that modernity cannot fairly blemish with critical detraction. Okay, so we see this all over, and I have some other talks and presentations that I give where I talk about living in a post-Christian space and picking up almost through osmosis post-Christian problems. The sort of sensibility that faith is opposed to science or that reason is opposed to belief. These are things that come explicitly and exclusively out of European historical experience. They're yeah. not the tradition of Islam and of the Muslims, and we'll actually circle back to this point at the end of the book as well. Um, so this is one key thing, is that the nation state is a product of a particular historical experience. That historical experience is not universal at all, and the Islamic subjectivity is something that is tied to a very, very different, fundamentally different historical experience. It's also different in the location of legislation. As we said earlier, the sovereignty within an Islamic society belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, and he delegates, well, he, he does two things. He communicates that sovereignty through his sharia, and he delegates some of that sovereignty to the interpreters of that sharia, right? And even less, he delegates to the executors or implementers of that sharia, okay? So we have here that paradigmatically, the sovereignty belongs to Allah, and the legislation belongs to Allah, right? Legislation within an Islamic sort of society is much more um, fixed. What we can do, as he'll say later, we'll sum up, is 
much more minor adjustments or extrapolations even than rather than fundamental paradigm shifts. Now marijuana is legal before it was illegal. Now we're talking about making hard drugs legal. Now we're talking about legalizing prostitution. It used to be illegal. Homosexuality was a mental illness. Now it's actually celebrated, right? These are wild swings of the pendulum from one side to another. This is what it looks like to be untethered and unanchored and completely without a, a moral direction. When it comes to legislation, Islamic legislation is much more fixed and it is extrapolated from and it is interpreted and implied, uh, excuse me, applied, yes. But the location of legislation is very, very different. It's not in the sovereign will of people and their will, however that's interpreted. It's in the sovereignty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creator and maintainer of the world. Another difference is the degree of penetration. We talked about sort of, um, you know, the modern nation state is about disciplinary power and all the tentacles that it has in, in schools and in prisons and in police, et cetera, like that surveillance. This is something that is not part of Islamic history. This is not part of the Islamic historical experience, and it's not part of our uh, an Islamic society. We have the sort of the, the axiom that the Sharia stops at your doorstep, right? You know, the famous story of Omar radiallahu anhu who scaled a wall and didn't seek permission and then saw someone drinking. And that is immediately invalid evidence because they obtained it sort of in an, in an unlawful way. So we don't have the same impetus to spy and surveil on other people and to then gather this information and track them down and, and find them guilty of this and that. We also don't have the same degree of penetration in education. Historically, Islamic education was extremely decentralized. It was, as Halak says, private, non-formal and highly accessible all those things together you had caliphs and their children and the viziers lining up at the halakat in the masjid right this uh, just like with the beggar and the the person who lives on the street this is a very highly accessible again non-formal no one's giving out transcripts and degrees and things like that there's the ajaza system but it's a far cry from what it takes to get licensed you know to be a lawyer or to be a doctor to be a nurse etc cetera, etc cetera. and it was private it was not done by the, the government. It was not under the control of the government, even if a sultan or a, a ruling dynasty pay, paid patronage to a madrasa or something like this. They did not have the control over it to dictate what they're going to teach and what they're not going to teach. This was something that was out of their power entirely. So if this is now, okay, you're saying, wait a second, Imam Tom, you're talking about subject formation. We haven't talked about Islamic subject formation. The point that Halak is going through all this is to show you that if Islamic society did not have these things, then how did it produce subjectivities? How did it produce the subject at all? If it didn't have the modern police surveillance and the, and the centralized totalitarian education, what did it do? Halak brings us back to the most central um, difference, I think, between the modern society and the Sharia society. The Sharia society asks, how can we be moral? It takes morality for granted because the Sharia itself, remember, is the unity of what is legal and what is moral. And we'll talk more about that in a bit. Whereas modern society and modern philosophy asks the question, why should we be moral in the first place? It does not take morality for granted. Morality is something that must be proven. It's something that is more removed, more, more remote from the real self, which is matter and neurons firing and hormones and, and atoms, whereas morality is something that might be or might not be. And this mm -hmm. is something that is not even recognized by the Sharia or by a Sharia-based society. It's inconscionable, it's unfathomable that a person could be separated from morality or from moral duty. So what does subject formation look like within a Sharia-based society, it doesn't look like the morality police that people maybe get a bad taste of, or they people think, especially when they watch our videos, you know, you always see the comments and some people say, oh, you uh, go to Iran or go to, you know, Saudi Arabia in the 90s with the hey, uh, right? The morality police that are going to, you know, uh, spy on people and investigate people and arrest people, et cetera, et cetera. This is not what Halak's talking about. This is not what it talks, what, what, what we're talking about here. We talk about subject formation, okay? That is simply criminal law, if it's even we can call it that. In fact, it's actually a very modern interpretation of law and subject formation. Um, what we're talking about here is something that is more of a multi-layered social constitution. Okay, The Sharia starts, it begins by assuming a moral agent. It assumes 
that the individual is moral. There is no question. Why be moral? Should I be moral? You are moral. And from there, it builds up. Everything about the Sharia society is dedicated to building that moral capacity. Okay, when it comes to the family, when it comes to the masjid, when it comes to the different sort of other organizations, the tribe, et cetera, et cetera, it has to do with how do we build that moral capacity from the ground up. And he makes a very, very important point here, which is returning to the idea of Sharia being the unity between law and uh, and morality. So it's he he really takes issue with the translation of Sharia as Islamic law. Um, not in the modern definition of what law is, because the modern definition of law is, is structurally and completely separated from morality. Sharia is actually the unification of these two things, the law and morality. And you can tell that by picking up any fiqh book in the entire tradition of Islamic oh, scholarship. Funny you should mention that. Here, I have one here, which is actually... Oh, you got one as well. Oh, no, um, that's great. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Uh, I got the Al Muatta, which is actually uh, the according to the back cover is written in the eighth century CE uh, by uh, Malik uh, bin Anas. He was known as the Imam of Medina in, in Arabia. This is the first surviving written treatise of Islamic law in existence. Um, this is a, a brand new uh, edition, uh, a translation of the Royal Moroccan. Uh, edition uh, edited by Mohammed uh, Fadl, who's a, a professor at University of Toronto. Now, the reason why this matters, so this is the first compendium of Islamic law. Okay, so you think, so looking at the contents page, so what do you imagine would be in a book of Islamic law? Well, let's look. It's start with the punishments, right? It's got to start with cutting it's off hands. Start and... with cutting off hands, surely. No, the book one, and this is something that Halak mentions in detail, so this is supplementing his point. Book one, the book of obligatory prayer time, Salah. Book two, the book of ritual purity. Book three, the first book of prayer. The next book, forgetful. In fact, the first nine books are all to do with prayer. And then you get, oh, and you get some more prayer. And then after that, you get the alms tax. This is the zakat. Then after that, you have, oh, the book of pilgrimage. This is the hajj, of course. Oh, and then you have um, the book of fasting. Now, this, you know, there are 45 books in this massive compendium, the first ever of Islamic law, the Maliki score. And about half of it, or more than half, is to do with things that would not be considered law in the Western sense at all. In fact, it's only the very end, and I, book 42 out of 45, and I read this, uh, it's called The Book of Lapidation, uh, Rajam, which we won't go into, and the, mandatory, the, the Mandatory Criminal Punishments, the Hadood. Only there do you get what many in the West identify with as Islamic law or the Sharia. The rest of it is to do with divorce, sales, breastfeeding, as chaptered there, um, uh, farmland, investment partnerships, compensation for battery, collective, I, I won't go on and on and on. But this is absolutely typical, typical. In fact, this is the standard for Islamic law, as Halak says. It starts off with prayer. You know, what are we before God? It's our intention, our niya before God as moral persons, as moral agents. This is this is the basis of Islamic law, not criminal law. Um, but anyway, I just wanted to share with us that this is a great book. I do recommend this edition, by the way, uh, Abu Atta. It's just been published earlier this year. That's fantastic. And that's a wonderful illustration. So what did what did Orientalist scholarship from the West do when they came across these legal manuals that had, you know, uh, 41 out of 45 chapters dedicated to things that didn't have anything to do with what they thought were law? They said, oh, look at these irrational Orientals. Like they don't even know what law is. And they didn't realize that this is a certain philosophy of law that actually stands to educate the West and teach the West where they went wrong. And we'll get to that at the end of uh, the book as well, inshallah, is that it's all about building moral capacity. How can somebody adhere or obey to the law that stops someone from stealing before they can obey the, the command from their creator that they have to pray five times a day? We have, and, and I don't mean to get controversial, but we have this guy, um, you know, who, who's gotten popular in uh, Pakistani circles, who some people are claiming he's the Mehdi or something because he relates right. dreams. And he, I haven't looked into it terribly, but I did see one interview where he, he admits that he doesn't pray five times a day. He what? says that he doesn't even pray once a week. <laughs> <laughs> and so... You know, the, the the simplest refutation of people like this, whether he's a liar or just merely being deceived, 
um, is that if you can't pray five times a day, I can't trust in what you say, right? Is that this is all about building moral capacity, right? So from the very, very first, the differentiating between different types of water, what's the type of water that will make you eligible to pray or not? What are the times of the prayer? How can you now, your, your duty now is to perform this prayer. Once you've got that, okay, now you've got this other thing that you have to do, fasting 30 days a year, if, you're, if it's upon you eligible, right? Uh, then you have the alms tax, you have this. This is a ladder. This is a ladder of moral capacity building such that once you ascend that ladder, yes, at the very top of the ladder, and here are the criminal punishments, and now you have formed your subject. The Sharia has formed the subjectivity within you, that you are lovingly obedient to your creator, that you trust your creator, that he knows best, and that all of this is for your own facility, both in this world and the next. And so it's a unified whole. This well, is... Yeah, yeah, it's hard to say. And, and, and just say, so when I did read the chapter on Hadood uh, a few days ago, uh, it's very different from what people in the West think it is. Uh, that there is a there's a the complete dissimilarity, discontinuity between Western perceptions of Hadood and the reality in in the in the oldest uh, Islamic law book uh, in existence, upon which all the others uh, follow from. But also, I mean, I'm, I'm noticing what you're saying about the moral dimension to the law. Even John Locke, the so-called father of modern liberalism, had a big influence on the US Constitution. Even in his book on his letter on tolerance, he actually says that people, there's certain castes of people could not be tolerated in his ideal society. And one of them were atheists. <laughs> Why? How can you trust atheists who do, who do not believe in God? You know, they don't believe in anything. How could you possibly trust them? So he would not tolerate them. Even liberalism, at least in John Locke's form, could not tolerate atheism. So even there, and this is kind of the end of the story, really, for the, the moral dimension. But th there you get the sense that your character, your spiritual character matters. But that's probably the last time it's mentioned. After that, it's pretty much gone, I think, from Western political theory anyway. Mm -hmm. And that's that's tremendously significant. Um, you know, Halak has one of the best defenses of apostasy law uh, that I've seen in the English language. And this is the terms in which he couches it, is that once you understand that the Sharia is a unity, it's a whole, that it is a building of a moral capacity that the entire society depends upon you building this moral capacity within you. No one's forcing you to make the five prayers. You have to choose to get yourself up out of bed and do it yourself, right? And then you go through the rungs of the ladder and you're fully obedient as much as you can all the way up and down the ladder to refuse, right? To, to apostate from this, to leave this Dean once having been within it is to reject the technology of the self entirely. It's to reject the possibility of building your own moral capacity. And just like John Locke reasoned, how can we coexist with somebody? How is it not a crime, not only against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but a crime against everybody else in society? If one member of society, a rational, like, you know, confess, confessing person of sound mind, has all the proofs, is convinced otherwise, that to take all of this moral technology and say, nope, I am not going to build my moral capacity. I'm going to stay just how I am. It is an existential threat to everybody else in that society. So if you understand mm -hmm. the Sharia as a whole, then this, you know, the punishments that exist for apostasy with the necessary conditions that are relevant makes complete sense. It's not just about treason. It's worse than treason. Some people have, you know, in apologetics, they liken it to treason, and that's true. But it's more than treason. It is a rejection of even the entire project of building your own individual moral capacity and how can society function if people reject that in total. As, 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 a, as a footnote, uh, Thomas Aquinas in his similar theological he discusses this question of policy, uses mm -hmm. a similar kind of logic, actually, a similar kind of re reasoning. Mm -hmm. And he is a preeminent Catholic Christian theologian probably of all time. So the, 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 what we're encountering now is a very modern issue. It's not something that Christianity yes. or Islam classically uh, had an issue with at all. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, no, exactly. This is a very modern sensibility and everybody has the responsibility if you have the sensibility to do a little genealogy work, not just of where you come from and your last name and your DNA sequencing, but of your ideas and your thoughts and your sensibilities to see where yeah, they yeah. come from. Because yes. in fact, they are very recent and they're very novel and they have metaphysical assumptions behind them that are very, very new. So just to give the full reference, Halak says on page 127, he said he, he knew it was it was fire, so he put it in italics. Fundamentally, therefore, apostasy is the rejection of the moral instruments that fashion the moral subject. 
If it is one side of the coin, jihad is the other. Apostasy law intends to curb the moral damage of the community's inner sphere, and jihad intends to protect and, if possible, expand the limits of that sphere. Mm -hmm. And that is, again, one of the best defenses I've seen of it, or rationalizations of it that I've seen in the English language. This brings us to the third part of this chapter, which is now, okay, we have sort of the modern, uh, the, the, the nation state's subjectivity. We have the Islamic subjectivity. Can they be combined? Are they compatible? Can they coexist? Halak says, absolutely not. And a historical proof for this is that in order for Europe, Western Europe, to economically colonize the Muslim world, they had to dismantle this entire project, the Sharia of subject formation, that yeah. they could not have done what they did without having first dismantled the Sharia and dismantled its project of subject formation. There's other proofs as well. So he talks about, you know, whereas the modern nation state and its sort of Western philosophical or metaphysical assumptions, we're talking about why be moral in the first place. The Islamic uh, society says is focused on how to be moral instead, whereas Western society, modern society is focused on the mind and the body, the discipline of these things that the Islamic society is focused on the discipline of the soul from which intention comes, from which volition comes, instead of just merely getting people to comply externally to whatever rule that you decide is fair and just. Whereas the modern nation state is obsessed with the political and everything is political, the Islamic society is obsessed with the moral and everything is moral. And finally, the modern nation state is obsessed with fact, mere fact, that fact separated from moral concerns what just what it is, real politic, quote unquote, um, whereas the Islamic society is focused on what ought to be, what is the right thing to be done. They are both hegemonic, okay, mm -hmm. idealistically, mm -hmm. meaning that the Islamic subjectivity renders the modern subjectivity nonsensical. And he says in another part of the book that for somebody who's sufficiently constituted by the Islamic subjectivity, they will look at someone constituted by the modern subjectivity and think that this person is a brute. This person's a true savage. This person is a narcissist, is selfish. They can't see anything that matters. They're almost just an imbecile, right? Whereas on the flip, on the flip side, the modern subjectivity renders the Islamic subjectiv subjectivity impossible. It displaces it. It seeks to neutralize it. It views it as, a, as an existential threat that must be terminated in order to do its work. Uh, just, just to say, as another kind of brief, brief footnote, I'm not aware of any other religion or philosophical paradigm or ideology in the world that does what Islam does in the way it's been described. It, it, it's, it's unique. And it's not unique historically, one can talk about you know the state of is Israel in the in the Old Testament, for example, which was ruled by prophets and had God's laws and so on. But in terms of our, our world today, in in our, in our current day, the, the Islam is the only system of thought, religion, faith, uh, holistic worldview, uh, which does what you're, what we're talking about. There's no other, and that's that's why Islam is the only. Many would say, I think rightly, is the only solution uh, for mankind's problems, bar none. And there's not kind of just because we prefer Islam, but it really is the only one. <laughs> and and folks like Andrew Tate recognize this, and that's why yeah. we have more and more high-level conversions, because people understand. And, and that was part of my conversion as well. I, I very early recognized that Islam was the last Thanks. thing left. Um, so, or, or, as Tim Winter said to me, uh, Islam is the last bus home. It's a very prosaic English way of putting it. But, but what he means is it's, it's, the, it's the last bus home. It's the, way, it's the last way to go to, to, to paradise, uh, to the next life. It's, it's the last one. Beautifully said. Um, so that ends chapter five. Um, chapter yeah. six, Halak starts with something that I think honestly is kind of a summary of everything up until now. So, you know, chapters one through five, kind of, uh, we can put a stop there. Uh, he's going to resummarize something uh, in a very, very important way. He's going to talk about what is Islamic governance holistically, if we're going to say minimum, bare minimum, what needs to exist in order for Islamic governance to occur? And then in chapter six, he deals with, uh, he goes on to deal with sort of how would a potential Islamic governance interact in a globalized world of liberal modern nation states? Mm -hmm. So the um, he, he runs through real quick, I think nine points, nine mm -hmm. points to minimally establish Islamic governance. And this is taken from, again, the intro to the book up until the end of chapter five, that 
there must be divine sovereignty. Sovereignty must be invested in the divine as opposed to in popular will, which is yep. the foundation of the modern nation state. And that this is expressed or communicated in the Sharia. And the Sharia obviously is made up of moral, practical, legal norms. The second point of the Islamic governance is that the the there has to be a sort of decentralized and independent class of ulama legislators, people who are interpreting, but more discovering what is the legal will of the sovereign. Okay, all of these moral, practical, legal norms, there has to be people that are outside of the sphere of government power that are interacting with the texts, interpreting the texts, and um, guiding the way how to extrapolate the supply. Exactly, which unfortunately is often not the case with modern so-called Muslim states where the uh, the, the ulama, the, the, uh, the scholars are paid by the state or completely um, shackled to the state and can't in any way, there's no there's no separation, no independence, there's no space between them at all. And th this historically is completely un-Islamic. It's not how it's supposed to be. It is. And it it it, uh, it punctures a hole in the, in the argument of people who say, well, why don't you guys, you know, you guys are two Westerners here talking about how Islam is so great. Why don't you go move to <laughs> uh, an Islamic country that apply Sharia. And this is what we've said before and many times for those who would take heed is that uh, this is uh, that the modern power with an Islamic veneer is not an Islamic society and is not an Islamic governance. And if you have a society where the ulama are controlled by the state and that their parameters of what they can say and what they can't say are shaped by the state, then this is not Islamic society and it's certainly not Islamic governance. Yeah. Um, which also, and I'll say this again, I've probably mentioned before, is a competitive advantage or an opportunity that must be exploited by Muslims in the West, in the United States, in the UK, and other places where we can form institutions to produce Islamic scholarship that is outside the tentacles of any state power. Um, we're not there yet. It's very immature, but we can build the institutions and even bring folks from abroad if possible and bolster our own sort of effort so that we can actually be a refuge where independent scholarship can take place. Um, but it has to be true to form. Yes. Yeah, it exists. I mean, it, it, I, I mean, you can speak to America, but in, in England, we have the Cambridge Muslim College in, in Cambridge, of course, uh, which is uh, independent of the state in terms of its, uh, you know, what it teaches uh, and, and is producing some excellent scholarship and some brilliant young scholars. So I think it does exist. I believe there's a place in California as well. Yes, so there's a tuna in California, but we need mm. much more. We need much oh, more. Yeah. It, like that's the, that's the only point is that um, is that we have a real opportunity to be uh, a major player or to be a refuge to to be maybe the incubator. If you look at the Renaissance and sort of the cross pollination that happened, you know, trying to help solve the Ummah's problems, um, we can be, I think, an intellectual core. And alhamdulillah, I think a lot of good work is being done, definitely. Um, but we need, uh, I'll always say this, you know, as, as long as Muslims are putting their brightest minds towards medicine and engineering, we're, we're limiting I, ourselves. I, 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 always bright young Muslims, I mean, they're always going to be accountants or lawyers or yes. computer scientists or what is it? Oh, dentists. That's the That's other right. thing. Thank yeah. you. Is that it? Is that is that the scope of human vocations? No, of course it's not. And I, I know why they're doing it. And they're, and they're they're noble vocations, and they're good vocations, and they're they, they earn a lot of money. But there are many other things we we, we need. A, uh, but anyway, that's, another anyway that's exactly the the discrepancy I'm just trying to highlight is how much more we can be doing. Like we have such an opportunity here, we should fully exploit that opportunity with our best and brightest. So back to the points of Islam, the minimum requirements for Islamic governance. We talked about the first two. Number three, Halak says, is that the legislative and judicial powers, they integrate fact and value. Whereas in Western modern society, fact and value have been separated. What is considered legal is mere fact. You know, we're not considered as we, we don't care about forming moral people. The government doesn't necessarily care about your morality or your ethics um, in a strict structural way, or as Halak would say, a thick way. Well, we need to bring those two things back together, that legislative and judicial powers have to integrate fact and value. We have to be oriented to ought, what should be, what is the right thing to do, what is the, the, the principle of the thing, and that that should be animating society. Number four, that the executive power is limited to implementation and temporary and uh, small-scale administrative regulations consistent with point number one, is that the executive is not this all-powerful, totalizing sort of figure, is that really they are just a steward, a facilitator, maybe we could say, a facilitator 
of the ulama class of the different sort of legislation that already exists in the Quran that needs to be um, interpreted and applied into new situations. They are a facilitator for that work. And if there are some administrative procedures that need to be implemented along the way to facilitate that, then that is their that is their purview. As Omar ibn al-Khattab, I think, is the shining example of this in the Khulafa al-Rashidin. Very, very fascinating to look at his history, his 10 and a half years as a Khalifa, and the administrative um, innovations that he instituted um, are very, very fascinating. They were not about sovereign power for him. It was about facilitating the sovereign power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expressed through the Sharia. Um, point number five, he said, um, that number one, remember the divine ser- uh, the divine sovereignty is put in the service of society, nurturing moral actors. It's not the production of profit for profit's sake. It's not the extension of the state for the state's sake. It's not the pursuit of the national interest, which is really an empty category that we people can fill with whatever content they wish is right. that the idea behind the moral practical legal norms they are put in the service of society and nurturing moral actors number six he says there is a there is decentralized and independent education formed of points one through five we've talked about the importance of this already point number seven that knowledge and education have to similarly just like the law aim at moral excellence and ultimately salvation, that they are not considered, just like we said, just about profitability, just about economic security, the holy trinity of the Muslims, unfortunately, in the West is doctor, lawyer, engineer, right? This can't be the aim of education. Education, yes. Mm -hmm. Education has to be aimed at moral excellence and salvation. Point number eight, the citizen as a category and as a subject must be displaced by the morality, so you mean by the moral community of believers, that is the Islamic subjectivity, and finally, that we achieve some sort of or aim at a truly holistic self-care. And that's a really interesting language that that Halak uses um, because this term has been co-opted and has a more superficial meaning in sort of, you know, uh, holistic self-care is like you know, taking a bubble bath and putting on a face mask, <laughs> right? Um, as okay, opposed to... California style, very much California style. Yeah. Right, exactly. As, as opposed to... Halak's talking about something completely different. Indeed he's, is. <laughs> he's talking about that the individual understands themselves as an extension of a morally imbued universe. That that is what it means to have a holistic understanding of the self, right? That you're situated in a moral universe, therefore you are a moral actor in a moral universe that has moral significance, and that it is self-care because engaging in those moral choices, building your moral capacity, and ultimately making moral decisions is taking care of you. Is taking care of yourself, just like uh, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala said in Surah Shams and other places. Right? It's like the one who uh, the successful one is the one who purifies it, the soul. And the you, person, that's where the word zakat comes from. You said that. Yes, in, uh, exactly. Well, it sounds like zakat. That, that's, that's the point. It is exactly purifying your wealth in the case of zakat, and in this case, Halak's idea of holistic self-care is that you're purifying yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, that brings us to now he he in 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 question number or excuse me in um, chapter number six he goes on to talk about okay well this sounds all great and ideal you know Halak is is accused by many academics of being overly idealistic by being nostalgic etc and that's why I hope to incorporate and respond to some of the the criticisms of Halak in in, a, in our future video inshallah um, so one of these things one of the common critiques of Halak is that okay this is so idealistic there's no way even if a Sharia society existed that it would last for even a second because the rest of the world is populated by cold, hard, real politic, liberal nation states that are et cetera, et cetera. And Halak, you know, he he does recognize and acknowledge that it, it, there are tremendous challenges. And we'll talk about specifically what those challenges are. Um, but however, um, you know, he does talk about sort of, um, he illustrates, let's say, the dynamics that are there and how maybe we can step into them and what are sort of the opportunities and what are the challenges of stepping into this sort of fray that already exists. The first thing that we need to talk about, okay, so number one, question number one is how does a Sharia society relate to the rest of the world? You can't talk about that without talking about 
globalization, which is why Halak first begins by talking about globalization. Now, some people have a misunderstanding here, and they have a modernist bias when it comes to globalization. They think that that globalization uh, only exists in the modern sphere, when in pre-modern times or in traditional societies, there was a degree of commercial globalization. There was, you know, the, the amber trade of northern Europe was connected to Arabia and, you know, the, the East Indies and things like that, right? Um, there were globalized, certainly regional, but even globalized trade networks that go back quite far, uh, quite further than, than modernists are willing to admit, who attempt to portray the globalization of commerce as a feather in the cap of modernity. Look, we brought you globalization. We brought you, you know, now you have cinnamon from, from India and you have, you know, vanilla from Madagascar, et cetera, et cetera. These things existed for quite a long time. What we mean by modern globalization, modern globalization is a little bit different and it has things that um, distinguish it from pre-modern forms of globalization. One is that uh, Halak describes it as virulently economic, okay? So whereas um, economic, yes, previously, previous types of globalization were economic, um, but they were more or less on the terms of mutual consent and trade, you know, pure commerce. What we have now is we have predatory economics. We have the imposition of certain economic orders on states. Um, you know, look no further than the international organizations of the IMF and the World Bank, et cetera, et cetera. Um, recently, the United States froze, I think, assets uh, for Uganda, I believe, or something or other, because Uganda, you know, recriminalized homosexual uh, acts. Okay, so this is this is economic imperialism. So this is the type of um, globalism that exists today. It's not merely mutual trade or or sort of even a pre-modern sort of struggle for resources. This is something that this is politics by another means. Um, another distinguishing aspect of sort of modern globalization is that it is intrusively political and cultural. Okay. Um, that means that there is cultural hegemony that goes on, like a cultural imperialism that is going on, and even political imperialism. We need look no further than our brothers and sisters in Pakistan that had Imran Khan recently uh, arrested and he was deposed from power. And now there are leaked um, sort of communications that the United States government was encouraging uh, the deposition of Imran Khan and basically saying, well, we're ready to go back to completely fine relations as long as you get rid of this guy. Um, so that is the type of political intrusion that is a hallmark of sort of modern globalization, whereas that type of intrusion did not exist before. Um, McDonald's in Tokyo, McDonald's all over the world, right? Western ways, you know, Coca-Cola, all these sorts of things. Obviously this is, you know, cultural imperialism and this is more well known. So I, I think we'll, we'll, we'll speak less about that. Um, the main thing here, one of the main features of this is that this is not based off of mutual consent in the way of old commerce. This is not a free market. This is imposed, okay? The stronger states impose upon the weaker states. That's the hallmark of modern globalization, whether it's an economic order or a political order or leader or even cultural, right? The access to markets, the access of certain multinational corporations, this is something that is imposed upon weak states. And so there's something that <clears throat> we could say is a selective permeability when it comes to globalization. People are not mobile, they're not free, right? Or they're not as free as capital is. If I show up to the airport, I have to produce my passport. They run a background check. If I'm on some sort of list, I get taken aside for questioning. Um, whereas when it comes to McDonald's, McDonald's can go wherever the heck it wants to go. As also just another footnote, the International Criminal Court, which um, uh, is meant to ensure justice internationally, the, the, the big, big players like the United States simply are not signatories to this. Uh, and so uh, they're never going to be held accountable for their war crimes, but they expect other countries to be accountable. So they'll they'll say, why isn't Russia? Russia needs to be held accountable at the International Criminal Court, but not us Americans, because, hey, we, we are special and different. And it, it tends to be populated by poorer African nations who tend to get hauled up mm -hmm. in front of this court, uh, whereas the powerful nations, of course, don't. Uh, so there's no real justice. It's all very asymm asymmetrical. Very, very true. hundred percent. Halak goes on a brief, um, a, a brief maybe tangent here, but it's an interesting one for people who are concerned about how, um, what's the status of the nation state within the globalized order? There's basically two theses out there. He summarizes them. Some people conceptualize this type of modern globalization as eroding the autonomy and the sovereignty of the nation state. They're saying, well, look at these multinational corporations. They're so popular. They can go wherever they want, do whatever they want. Others say, no, this is actually bolstering the autonomy of the nation state. And I lean towards the latter. I think that um, the modern type of globalization that we have 
bolsters the autonomy of the nation state. As Halak, he doesn't come out so explicitly to say one or the other. He actually says there's kind of like a halfway in between as kind of a mix, but he does point out the ways in which the nation state is bolstered by, uh, by the modern type of globalization that the state always gets to dictate the terms. The state always gets to play referee. Just like you mentioned with the International Criminal Court, with the IMF, the United States has that veto power on the UN, right? When it comes to access to markets, when it comes to IMF bank loans, right? Who ultimately is pulling the strings and pushing it one way or the other? The states, right? And the states basically allow things to happen. It just well, very well, just to correct you, it's the United States, not just the states. It's not like Uganda uh, is calling the shots, is it? You yeah. Uh, it's you, the United States, I, America, uh, which where, where you are, that, that, that they tend to have the hegemonic war, like the, the World Bank, for example, in loans. And stuff. Yes, 100 percent. And sometimes they 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 collude with each other. So there's a, a block of Western states that kind of comes together yeah. for extra force. But the Western leading states. definitely 100 percent, the leading voice uh, and the most hegemonic, the big baddie, the belly of the beast uh, is is uh, is the United States. Um, and there's reasons for that. But that's outside of the scope of today's that's discussion. So Islamic governance is completely incompatible with modern globalization. That's one thing that Halak puts his foot down on, and I agree entirely. If you look at how this system is constructed, Islamic governance is completely incompatible with it. Even on the level of business organization, the unit of business that is called the corporation. Now, he has a lot of work both in this text, but even more so in the next book, Restating Orientalism, where he talks about the history of the corporation and that the corporation as an entity has a really interesting history, even in the West, even in England, where it was debated whether this thing should be allowed to exist or not, particularly the LLC, the Limited Liability Corporation. Why? The concern was that it was diminishing or subverting personal moral responsibility. If you and I get together and make an LLC, something goes wrong, we take someone's money, et cetera, et cetera, there's only a certain degree to which we can be held responsible, less so than if I'm just a private citizen or a personal actor, et cetera, et cetera. So he states, and I don't see anything wrong with it, that Islamic law is completely against this technology, which is why that Sharia societies or Muslim societies did not adopt the corporation as is known, the LLC, as is known in the West um, for a long time, because it is immoral. The de- de- sort of, um, you know, divorcing yourself of that type of responsibility is not uh, proper at all. And, um, and so he rejects even at the micro level, right? So what do you think about the macro level when it comes to all these corporations with their, you know, uh, economies of scale and their resource exploitation and their involvement in the predatory sort of capitalism, et cetera, et cetera, that this is something that is very much against Islamic governance. Um, And so there raises the question. He doesn't really necessarily explore it, but he presents it as a challenge that Islamic governance and Islamic society, a Sharia society has to figure out how it is going to function in a globalized world when the mainstay of modern globalization is something that is completely inimical to Islamic governance and a Sharia society. He contrasts that. He says, you know, what is so different about this sort of um, Islamic society from the modern globalization, the corporation, the way the economy is run? He says that Islam's sense of economy is primarily a moral economy is that the secular economy is a liberal one, one that is dictated by values and ideals of free trade and free movement of capital, of profit motive motive of privatization and accumulation. But when it comes to Islam's moral economy, it has to do with the maqasid of the sharia, the things that are guarded against all else, the deen, the religion at the top of them, being guarded against all else. That's the, it's not profit motive, it's deen motive, right? Like what's going to preserve our deen? Then pre- the preservation of life, the preservation of intellect, the, preser- the preservation of family or sex, depending, there's a difference of opinion between the ulama, um, and then the preservation of wealth. The preservation of wealth is part of this, okay? But he stresses that these five maqasid cannot be taken autonomously. You cannot separate one from the rest. That mm-hmm. they are an integrated whole and they are codependent. That each of them inflects the other and imbues the other with a certain moral quality. Okay, so when we have the deen, there are certain technologies that we have 
or things that we have that help us or empower us to protect it, such as the technologies of the self and subject formation, the laws about Ridda and Jihad that he talked about. We talk about the preservation of life. We have laws about capital punishment. We have um, sort of, uh, you know, we have blood money, we have kasas, we have these different things. You know, when it comes to the intellect, we have laws that determine legal capacity. We have laws that pro prohibit intoxicants, um, et cetera, et cetera. So we have everything that is there to protect the most essential things. But look at how different this scheme is from mere profit motive. The idea, again, we separate is from ought. We say, well, I can do it. Therefore, why shouldn't I? Right. Um, the idea of absolute property rights uh, in the we brought up Locke in the tradition of Locke. I own it. Therefore, I can do whatever I want with it, whether it's burn it or sink it into the sea or whatever I want. Um, so this is very, very different, obviously, from the economy or the theory or conceptualization of what economy is in the globalized world. And so this is something that needs to be resolved. Um, so concluding, in concluding for this particular chapter, he says these are the challenges. The challenges are, one, the militarism of the modern nation states and their society, two, the cultural imperialism. And that includes, that includes advertising and marketing. It includes the sexualization of bodies and objectification of people, right? Um, all of these, he says a beautiful you know, phrase where he says, every single piece of art must be scrutinized from an Islamic lens it to be a truly Islamic society. Don't think that an Islamic society is just going to accept everything from the West culturally. We need to fight against the cultural imperialism by generating culture from our own subjectivity, from our own sort of Sharia-based or Sharia-informed society um, and produce a culture therefrom. Uh, and then finally, the liberal capitalist world market, um, obviously with the, its corporation as its sort of logical necessity and defining feature of it, that Islam has to, or the Islamic society or Muslims have to figure out how these things are going to go together. And that brings us to the conclusion. There's one last chapter. <laughs> By the way, I just point out to the, to the viewer, if you didn't already know that uh, Professor Halak is actually a Christian. <laughs> He's not a Muslim, um, although um, quite what he means by his Christian faith, I don't know. But a, a lot of this stuff, uh, he, he, his understanding of Islam is much better than many Muslims, I think. Uh, you know, he really gets to the the essence, the interior sense of what the Islamic, the Sharia is about. Uh, it's extremely unusual for a non-Muslim to get it, but he does. Yes, and he's willing to, he he wants to put his foot down and preserve what makes Islam Islamic, as opposed to, unfortunately, the many folks within our own ranks that have been contaminated by liberalism and the nation state, which have yeah. thrown away what makes Islam distinctive by trying to assert uh, a Frankenstein Islam that really is no different from progressive liberal values, unfortunately. May Allah, may Allah guide us all. Very true. That brings us to the conclusion, chapter seven, which he entitles "The Central Domain of the Moral." So we have some meditations and some some summaries here going on. Um, his main point, and this is a point, and he actually begins by criticizing Islamists, um, at least historically. Islamists have assumed that the nation state is a neutral technology that can just has to be hijacked and used for our own purposes. Uh, Halak is the anti or the antithesis of this idea. He says that you cannot instrumentally use the nation state you cannot in order to achieve an islamic society you cannot instrumentally use the nation state why because thinking that you can instrumentally use anything in the first place is a product of western enlightenment values instrumental rationality or instrumental reason it's reflective of this is ought split this idea quote unquote that this is just real politic and i see some people who who parrot this line and it, it it demonstrates an unfamiliarity with political theory and with political philosophy to think that this is just what is real the whole point is that islam is critiquing your understanding of what is real and what is not in the first place and we fundamentally disagree with the secularists and the liberals about what is real and what is not real so then to claim that you're just going to engage in politics and it's real politic, you have a definition of what is real that's against Islam. So how are you going to do anything for Islam or construct an Islamic society if you are reifying or reproducing uh, this split? Okay. The second problem with that idea that you cannot, you, you instrumentally using the nation state, Halak says you cannot instrumentally use the nation state, first of all, because 
the idea of instrumental instrumentality is already a product of enlightenment philosophy and values. The second, because the nation state itself is yeah. imbued and infused with hegemonic subject forming metaphysical assumptions that are completely contradicting, displacing and neutering, perhaps castrating to the Islamic society and the Islamic subjectivity. It's a product of European history, but particularly the local area of the globe. It's not some kind of universal and natural thing. It is a product of the, the, the European struggles against the church and the emergent uh, the post enlightenment world. So this is historically localized into Europe. It's become more globalized, but it is a European product. Yes, and he gives a very, very telling and powerful historical example or uh, an analogy. He says, just like um, Aristotle's logic or Aristotelian logic, he said, you know, there was a point in which some Muslim philosophers or some Muslim theologians assumed that they could instrumentally use Aristotelian logic in order to justify or to argue for Islam and the sort of points and the beliefs of, excuse me, of Islam. But as he points out, Aristotelian logic assumes certain things. It has certain content metaphysical assumptions, even in its very categorization of this from distinguished from that, that cannot be shed from it, that lead you to certain conclusions that are actually incompatible to Islam. So he likens this to the nation state, that this is something that if you attempt to use it instrumentally, it is it has a logic that is internal to it and inseparable from it. It has certain assumptions that contradict and actually undermine Islam and that it is not something that can possibly be utilized in such a way. What are these major incompatibilities? So he lists them out. He says five in the conclusion. One is the anthropocentric idea of the... Mm. Okay, so to have the idea that the, 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 the sovereignty is invested in the will of the people or in popular will, this is a very anthropocentric perspective. It is divorced of God. Any theology or you know, theistic viewpoint is inimical to this idea that sovereignty exists in people, whether in the individual will of a citizen or in the collective will of a nation. Um, and that this leads to a certain will to power. If sovereignty is in the individual citizen or in the nation, then it creates an imperative to collectivize that into a power that has absolute power that exists for its own self. And it's not tied to any rule or law or ethic that's higher than itself. As opposed to number two, which he says that Islamic governance, on the other hand, cannot permit any ultimate sovereignty except that of Allah, is that it is founded upon truth, upon values, and it is restrained by the sovereignty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these are fundamental incompatibilities. This is why you cannot just simply use the nation state. Number three is that Islam actually has a better, more effective rule of law and separation of powers than the modern nation state. We talked in an earlier chapter about how Halak went into how the separation of powers um, in Western democracies is in fundamental tension and contradiction and really um, can't work. Um, and the rule of law similarly, whereas Islam and Islamic societies and the Sharia societies actually achieved a better separation of powers and a better rule of law than modern nation states ever have. For he says that subject formation, okay, so the subject formation is completely incompatible. We've already done that today. We've looked at how the nation state produces the docile, submiss submissive, and productive citizen, whereas the Sharia society produces the moral community the moral community of souls. It is fundamentally imbued with a definition of good, right? Whereas the modern nation state leaves good to up to debate. You know, you can have your opinion about what's good and I can have my opinion about what's good and we can go home and, you know, never come to terms about that. And six, finally, we have the separation of is and ought. The modern nation state claims to deal with simple fact, but that simple fact or that simple quote unquote real politic its definition of what is real is merely materialistic, and it is not metaphysical, um, or at least not, uh, it is unwittingly, right? It thinks that it doesn't have any metaphysical commitments. In reality, it does, um, even if they're very thin and contradictory. Whereas the Sharia society, the Islamic society, it is something that is, it is a community that is founded upon the possibility of ought, the moral imperative. What should we do? How can we be good? How can we be moral? And it takes these things for granted. The next 
so that was the major incompatibilities. Wrapping up here, the whole book, okay? So the, the, he has two sort of sub-chapters, but it's kind of very much a, a meditation and sort of a conclusion, and also leaving off on sort of thinking about possibilities for future research and action. Islam is the way out. That's one of the main points uh, of the conclusion and of the entire book. Islam solves the problems of the West. Islam stands to redeem the West for its errors, its excesses, and its incompatibilities and its contradictions. Whether it's spiritual vacuousness, whether it's the fragmentation of social life, whether it's hedonism, whether it's narcissism, whether it's the destruction of organic community and family and the natural environment, all of which are diagnostic of secular modernity, Islam is the only way out. Islam is the only thing, as we said just a minute ago, the last thing left. And it's important that Islam is the only solution because there is no solution that is merely a technological solution that is just simply, well, we need more freedom or we need better institutions or we need um, more environmental consciousness or, or conscious uh, raising or awareness campaigns. No, this is a moral issue. It is not an issue of technology. Technology is subsequent and after the moral issue. The technological issue is a consequence of the moral issue. And so the world needs a moral redemption because the problem is moral. Autonomous reason, the reason of the enlightenment, cannot save us. We can't think our way out of this. We can't reason our way to solving environmental degradation and the destruction of the family, the hedonism, the narcissism, and the sense of purposelessness that we have. We cannot reason our way out of this. Rather, reason must be restrained in order to solve this. Reason must be re-subsumed and subordinated to moral considerations, the moral considerations that are illustrated and communicated in the Sharia. And so we find here that Islam, Halak makes the point, is the middle path when it allots the role of reason. It is not hyper-rationalist of the Enlightenment logic, and it is also not hypo-rationalist of maybe some sort of modern religious revivalist movements that are um, reacting sort of in opposition to Enlightenment rationality. It is in the middle. Reason, yes, but reason is not autonomous. It is subsumed under the will of the sovereign, Allah, and it is put up with guardrails and operates with the moral imperative of how ought we to be moral? Mm -hmm. What should we do? How do we become good? How do we be good? This is what reason is for. And reason itself is not going to save us. What can we do? He ends on some uh, some very minor points. Well, you know, may, maybe not minor necessarily, but courses of action. He says there's two things that we can do, concrete things that we can do right now. One of them is the re-enchantment of our lives. Okay, Weber made this famous. Obviously, when it comes to the secular modernity, is a disenchant uh, a disenchanting force. So all of these sort of moral um, imbuedness of the creation of, uh, you know, sort of your relationality to everything in Allah's creation and your moral duty to it. This was all stolen from us by secular modernity. We have to get it back. And we get it back by understanding and applying the Sharia as it, um, you know, as holistically as possible when it, especially when it comes to letting the Sharia work on us to produce that Sharia subject inside of our bodies that we as, as we said our, our only thing about islamic law the sharia uh all the classical manuals they start off with prayer you know how to practice it uh, and they talk about fasting and they talk about pilgrimage and they talk about purifying your wealth all these moral qualities and the, there's a beginning always the beginning of any manual of islamic law throughout <laughs> islamic history it starts with these practices these technologies of the soul or whatever before it gets anywhere near criminal law which is right at the back Yes, 100%. So we need to start with ourselves, our intentions, our paradigm, and we need to go through that ladder. We need to climb that ladder. If the if we're building moral capacity, it starts with prayer, it starts with wudu. Don't think for a second that you're going to save the ummah if you're smoking cigarettes, right? You need to have the moral capacity to be able to turn that down. Don't think for a second that you're going to save the ummah no matter what degrees you have in political theory or political science if you can't stop the stinginess of your own soul or if you can't resist the temptation to lust. These are all together unity. They are not separate, discrete issues. They have to do with your capacity for moral action. And you only have to look at the history of social movements in the United States to tell this. Every single secular social movement was uh, mm. 
completely derailed and um, sort of uh, sabotaged by the FBI or by the CIA because it did not have any moral capacity for action or its moral capacity for action was extremely hampered and hamstrung and limited that they were not able to master themselves. They did not have a moral program like Islam has, um, which is why Islam is the answer and nothing else is the answer. So everything has to be filtered through the Islamic paradigm, the Sharia paradigm. And through this process, we will be able to look at what are truly our rights and duties to each other, to society, to the earth, etc. And then we're reverse engineering things and we have to create the institutions that are going to be able to empower us uh, to do that work, to secure those rights and to fulfill those duties. Um, the second thing, the second course of action that we have is our vocabulary and our discourse. That vocabulary and discourse carries ideas and assumptions. And we talked about this. If you look at uh, a textbook sort of study in this, look at how the LGBTQ movement has controlled the language and turned things into phobias and turned things into inclusion and celebration and diversity, et cetera, et cetera. Language games, as critical theory teaches us, that are basically setting the terrain and basically prefiguring who's going to win the argument and who's going to win the debate. Um, we need to engage in that discursive work. We need to work on our vocabulary in order to introduce things into our discourse that are going to carry these moral tenets that these sort of uh, the paradigm that we carry with us from the Sharia. And we will find, and Halak has a very interesting point that we'll end on, that when we do this, that we can actually identify sub-traditions and anti-traditions and dissident traditions within the West, anti-modernities -modern in the West um, and in Western history that actually have points of contact with our project and might be willing to join our project. And I think we've already seen that happen. Yeah. Again, with the you know the the, the neo trad sort of phenomenon online and the Andrew Tates and everybody like them that sees an Islam that had some sort of sensed somewhere in their being that this is not right, that the modern world is wrong and it's wrong, not in a, a superficial way, but in a fundamental it's way. Wrong and through and through. So it needs a, rad a radical solution. And all the, all the ideological solutions are, you know, with the fascism or communism or Marxism or liberalism and all these other isms that the West pumps out and goes through revolutions and accepting just uh, are, are just pirouetting on the same point. You need a, you know, a, a fundamental metaphysical change. And Islam does offer that. And the, as, as I said before, I'm not aware of any other religion that does it. Christianity no longer does it. Christianity today is a pietistic faith it's between your individual soul and Jesus. And kind of that's it, really. Um, uh, uh, Judaism you know, is, is, is preoccupied with other masses, shall we say, um, and so on. But Islam is the only one that has this holistic, truly holistic, uh, encompassing system that actually ennobles the human being rather than uh, degrades him or oppresses him. Yes. And so we can consider ourselves as a glacier that's slowly moving along and picking up gravel and as we go, right? There are going to be people that are dissenters and defectors from the modern liberal order that are going to join up with us along the way. That doesn't mean that we're building an equal coalition here and that their you know, tradition are equal to ours. No, Islam is supreme and Islam is on top and Islam is the only way and the Sharia is the only way. Um, but people will see that. And mm -hmm. we can incorporate them and include them as we go forward to attempt to redeem the world. And that's the end of the book. And Allah knows <laughs> that. <laughs> well, thank you very much for that. So this is the book, as we know, The Impossible State. Do read it. It's not always an easy, easy read, I must say. His, his prose is sometimes challenging. But there are and plenty of nuggets. And boy, are there plenty, plenty of insights mm -hmm. to make your mind boy, uh, you know, blaze with, wow. Um, so it's definitely, and it won the Columbia uh, Award, uh, the Columbia University Distinguished Book Award as well. So it's been recognized as an academic uh, success as well. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Imam Tom, for that extraordinary um, tour de force, really. I, I can't think you're the best person to do it. Uh, and uh, fantastic. Thank you so much. Alhamdulillah, thank you for the opportunity, and I look forward to more in the future. Inshallah. Inshallah. Until next time. Assalamu alaikum.